Welcome everyone to New HD NYC with your host Ray K. Available on all major podcast platforms and powered by New HD Media. Now here's your host, Ray K. Hey, I got a special guest. This is a iconic magazine. He is the fourth editor of Baseball Digest, the longest running baseball magazine in the world. Worked for the Yankees 11 years as a uh, senior director of media relations, which is pretty cool. We're going to talk about a lot of baseball stuff. It's my pleasure to welcome Rick Cerrone. Welcome, Rick. Hi, Ray. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How hey. are you doing, Rick? This is one of those once in a lifetimes with the virus. Uh, with, how has <laughs> that affected you and your work with COVID-19? Well, if you talk, if you look at it from a business, everybody has a story personally, how it's affected you personally. And I, I really believe that there are uh, untallied mental health issues. And I, I think we'll be dealing with that for many years to come. But from a business sense, uh, you know, we took a big hit. Okay. Um, we came through it. We're coming through it. But, you know, when this all started back in 2020, um, we lost that 1.70% of our, our newsstand outlets because our, our biggest retail outlet, which is Barnes & Noble, for a period of time, they took no, no magazine inventory. Um, that, was a, that was a hard thing to overcome. Uh, I think we're doing it, but like everybody else, it's been a challenge. Everyone has been challenged by this. Okay, okay. Now, Rick, I'm I want to talk about Baseball Digest first, and then I'm going to, I'm going to go back in time and, and how you got into all this talk about the Yankees and, you know, you, you know your, your growing up years uh, for a little bit. But how did you get this job? I mean, this seems like such a huge magazine. I, I had it when I was a kid. I just subscribed to it a few days ago. You know, I think it's good to have it on your, on your, on your table, you know, for your kids. To <laughs> to, well, to it's to an it. iconic magazine, um, one I grew up with when I, was, when I was younger, kind of lost track of it. And I quite frankly think the magazine kind of lost its way when it went from the digest size to the full size. And the way I got involved was simply that the people that were the owners of Baseball Digest made a decision that they were going to outsource everything. They were going to shut down their physical offices and outsource graphics, uh, ad sales, editorial. And they reached out to a graphics firm, the owner of which was a dear friend friend and colleague of mine. So he was going to provide Baseball Digest or was asked to provide him with six print ready issues per year. And he asked me if I wanted to write for it. And I didn't really want to be an editorial contributor. And I said, well, what's, I mean, who's going to be the editor? And he said, well, they're, they're going to hire a new editor uh, when they do this outsourcing. I said, well, I would be interested in that. So that's how the conversation began. But if they went to a different graphics designer, uh, which they ultimately did not use, um, they retained the, the graphics person that they had, which has been terrific. Uh, if, they did, if they went to some other graphics designer, not one that was a friend or colleague of mine, I, I, I would not be the fourth editor of, of, of Baseball Digest, which, you know, be disappointing, but that's just the way. A lot of things that happen are happenstance, but it's, you know, you can say, well, you were in the right place at the right time. Yeah, because I built relationships. I maintained a relationship with this colleague, um, both on a personal and a professional level. And I think if there's a message out to young people uh, who want to get into this industry, especially in this day of social media and, you know, communicating through the Internet, you, you really need to build relationships and you don't build them online. Relationships seem to be everything. Whenever you 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 have a new venture and you look back on how you got it, and it's just amazing all the different turns and twists and happenstances and all that. And you know, I guess that goes for everything, you know, in life. Well, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll take you back to uh, people often ask, "How did you how did you get the job with the Yankees? How did right. you get involved in baseball?" I mean, you know, I'm a sophomore in high school at Yorktown High School in Yorktown Heights, New York. And I'm, I'm probably flunking out of high school as a sophomore. I mean, I am a terrible student. So you talk about happenstance. My sophomore year, I get to class and I find out that I have a new guidance counselor because my guidance counselor from freshman year was named the school's principal. So I was assigned to a man named Bud Dowds. 
Now, I knew of Bud Dowd's because he was also the football coach. You know, funny thing is father, Bud Dowd's father, was the first head coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Oh, okay. So I, I, I knew him by reputation and seeing him in the halls. I don't know why, Ray, that I was given to Bud Dowd's and not to Mr. Baptiste or, or some other guidance counselor. Right. But I was given to Bud Dowd's. And then one day early in my sophomore year, probably the first week, He's sitting in his office and he's looking at my grades and he's shaking his head. And finally, he looks up to me and he says, what do you see yourself doing when you're a grown up or when you get out of high school or whatever? You're going to go out to go. And I knew that whatever I said to him, his answer was going to be, well, you're probably going to need a high school diploma for that. And the way you're going, you're not going to get it. The standard stock right. answer. So he asked me the question, what do you see yourself doing when you're a grown up? And my answer was very simple. That's easy, coach. I'm the public relations director of the New York Yankees. Whoa. And he was taken aback and he didn't give me that stock answer. He said something like, well, that's pretty specific. There's only one of those jobs in the world. Maybe you won't. You should want to be a public relations director for a professional sports team. And I said, nope, the Yankees. And I told him all about the PR director of the Yankees at the time, this is in like 1971, uh, what he did, what his re- responsibilities was, you know, he did the media guide, he did the press notes. And then he said to me, all right, I'll make you a deal. If you can get your grades up and keep your grades up, do you think you can do for my football team with this, what this Bob Fischel, the PR director of the Yankees does for the Yankees? And uh, when do I start? So that gave me focus. I am now, Ray, I'm the public relations director of the Yorktown High School football team. And then I added the basketball team, the baseball team. And that kind of set me on my journey. Now, was that happenstance or was that a miracle? I don't know. But I will tell you that I didn't say to Mr. Dowds, "Uh, nah, I'm going to pass on that. I'd I'd rather, you know know what I'm saying? You had to Um, seize the opportunity when, when, when you saw it. I seized the opportunity, and it looks like every opportunity that I seized or everything that was put in front of me that I turned into an opportunity led me to, albeit 25 years later, becoming the, the director of public relations for the New York Yankees. So there's there's a spiritual, uh, there's, a, there's a higher being in this. Well, I think there is, but, but you know, I, I also think that when, when happenstance happens, you have to take advantage of it. Right, right, right. It's uh, it's given. To, it's like a gift, you know, and you got to take it or or, or right. remove it, I guess. Yeah. Now, now, uh, all right. You mentioned the Yankees. You know, the the uh, we use the word iconic, the icon- most iconic team in, in in baseball, maybe all of history. How does how does that job come in? I mean, how'd you get that? That's right in the in the middle of that, right in the beginning of that run in '96, correct? Right, beginning. That's the key word. The, the beginning. beginning. Okay. <laughs> so uh, you know, I had long ago. When I had applied for the Yankees PR job uh, many times, because the funny thing is the year after, or when I went to college, I'm a freshman, another happenstance, I ended up going to Northern Illinois University. I had never been on a plane. Okay. And I ended up at Northern Illinois University uh, because a sports writer that I had met while being the PR director of the high school football team went to DeKalb, Illinois to become the sports editor of the DeKalb Daily Chronicle, calls me up my senior year and says, you got to come out and look at this this university here. Well, I did that. And that also helped me get to where I wanted to go because it was like my Disneyland. It had everything I could have possibly wanted to hone my craft. Because remember, Ray, in those days, there was no sports management courses and there was no only Ohio University, I believe, offered like a sports management. So I got into NIU and um, that set me on my path. But my freshman year, I applied for a summer job with the Yankees. And Bob Fischel, my idol, sent me a letter back. I remember it arriving in my mailbox at my dorm that there's nothing available and I'll keep your resume on file. Okay. Uh, but I'm, But frankly, I'm not optimistic. But Recent, recently, Ray, I went back and looked at that letter, and it's dated December 27th, 1972. And I realized that exactly one week later, Bob Fischel's life was turned upside down, and he had no way of seeing this coming. Because a week later, the Yankees were purchased by a group 
headed by a relatively unknown shipbuilder from Cleveland by the name of George Steinbrenner. And in the next 24 years, he went through at least a dozen PR directors. Okay, okay. You know, and at the time the job became available in nine, late 1995, 96, he was being parodied on a sitcom, Seinfeld. Remember George Costanza saying he oh, yeah. fires people like it's a bodily function. Right. So the job became available. Now I probably applied for the job three times in the eighties, okay. uh, late seventies, early, and never got the job. Um, so this time the job became available when let's just say the PR director, who's a great PR director, still a PR director of a major league team and Mr. Steinbrenner had a disagreement. Uh, I said at the time, made headlines, made back page headlines on Christmas Eve, 1995. And I said, I'm not getting involved in it. I get, I'm starting to get calls from my friends in the media, uh, you know, baseball writers. Hey, the job's open. They knew how much I always wanted the job. And um, I said, no, 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 because th this kid will get his job back. They'll work this out. And then two weeks later, I was told that they offered him his job back, but he, he decided not to take it. Um, and they're looking for a more senior person and your name keeps coming up. So if you want the job, here's who to call, whatever. So <clears throat> they got an appointment for an interview, drove up, you know, from Pittsburgh, um, stayed at my mom and dad's house and uh, went for the job interview. And I, I got home to my mom's from the interview and uh, she said, well, when do you think you'll hear? I said, I have no idea. And I think as soon as I said that, the phone rang. Okay. And it was the Yankees offering me the job. Uh, and the reason they, they moved quickly, because I was the last interview. And the next, the Sunday night was the annual Black Tie Baseball Writers Dinner. And they wanted their new PR director to be at that dinner. So the first question that I was asked was, can you, can you rent a tuxedo in 24 hours? <laughs> so that's how it started. Who was the guy that interviewed you for the for the job? A man named David Sussman, who was the COO, and he left the Yankees a year or two after that, three years after that, to go to MTV. But a terrific person, great leader, um, and he kind of got me, so to speak. You know, in I, I've been building up for that interview for twenty years, twenty five right, years. So right, right, right. I kind of nailed it. Yeah, yeah, you hit, you hit the proverbial, you know, grand slam, um, getting that job. Um, tell me, Rick, what a typical day was like. What, what does a media relations person do? Well, certainly with the Yankees, and I was also the, the head of media relations, although I had a director of media relations under me with the Pittsburgh Pirates uh, for six years, back when they had Bonds and Benia and the Killer Bees and everything. That was a very different experience, but a very rewarding experience. Small town team, everybody lived near you. You'd have a barbecue and half the team would come over. It was a very different experience from the Yankees. But Ray, there is no typical day. Okay. Because one of the things I tried to do, and I kind of learned this as I went, try to organize your day, try to keep your staff organized and not just, you know, writing a note here and I got an interview, I got ESPN coming in. So we, we end up having uh, department meetings. I tried to do them every morning at like 11 or noon or so and get everybody's thoughts. What are you doing today? What's happening? Go over requests that we would get, go over opportunities that we could solicit. So there really was, I mean, it was, a, if it was a game day, you had to have your notes done. You know, we did seven, eight pages of game notes, home road. Um, it, you know, that was the, you know, you had to have your notes done. You had to have everything ready to go. You'd go down when the clubhouse opened up and you, you know, help the media, monitor the media, arrange for Joe Torrey's down. Joe was the only manager I had there with the Yankees. Arrange his daily pregame meeting with the media, which then was in the dugout or in his office if the weather didn't allow. Now they have, you know, press conferences. They have them in a, we didn't have that room back at the old state. But Joe would be sitting at his desk, it seems. I always saw, like, after the yeah. game, he'd be at the Joe desk. Yeah, it was, it was much more informal. It's far more regimented now, far more organized. I don't believe that's a good thing. Uh, I think you lose the intimacy. I think, I think you lose the access. 
Um, you know, nobody's, you know, Joe would get done and someone would kind of trail him and do a follow up. Hey, I wanted to ask you this outside the group, but there really is no outside the group now. So if you kind of got a nugget or a story you're working on, you know, you're gonna have to find another way because you're not getting that one on one access. How was how was Joe Tory? I mean, he seems like oh, I mean, I, I, I don't think I would have lasted a year if, if not for Joe Tory. Okay. Um, Joe made a tremendous difference uh, in, in that team that was ready to win, but Joe was the right guy because one, he was the buffer between George Steinbrenner and the team. He right. kind of took it on with his, his demeanor was like, he didn't take it seriously. I mean, Joe told me very early on, it might've even been in spring training, um, you know, media would ask him how you could take this job. You know, the New York Post had a headline, Clueless Joe. And it wasn't that they thought Joe was a clueless person, but he was clueless to think that it would work with George, with Mr. Steinbrenner. But he said to me one day, and he said this to the media as well, he goes, look, I've, I've lost jobs before. You know, they don't take your house. They don't take your wife and kids. But, you know, so I'm, I'm looking at this as, you know, it's house money, so to speak. And that's kind of how I looked at it, too. I really expected to be with the Yankees a year, put it on my resume, you know, from everything I heard, every horror story I had heard. When I called the gentleman that I was supposed to be calling to get an interview, and I told him, and I knew the gentleman, Arthur Richmond, for years, and I'm telling him, Arthur, you know how much I want this job, you know how much I love the Yankees. I'm the, I made this pitch, and his response was, are you out of your mind? Like you can't, you can't succeed. There's no way. Huh. So the way I, I said, well, you're there, you succeed. Well, that's different. I go right back at him. I, you know, oh, oh. I said, well, you'll mentor me. You'll, you'll, you'll guide me. Okay. I'll call you back. So Joe made it really easy because all managers are different. Some are taskmasters. Um, you know, some are, uh, you know, they're involved in, in every aspect uh, but Joe, Joe was, he was wonderful. And that, and that's a large reason why the Yankees won those world series and got that dynasty going. Was the reason why it was going to be rough was because of George Steinbrenner? Well, that was, I mean, remember in, you know, from 1972, 73 to 1995, he went through 12 PR directors. By my math, that's an average of about two per two years per man. Right. You know, before me, the longest serving under Mr. Steinbrenner, the longest serving PR director was Harvey Green, who was there for like three and a half years. And he was known as the Lou Gehrig of Yankee PR directors. But I did not have a lengthy stay in mind. Um, and I will tell you that there were time, and I never got fired by Mr. Steinbrenner, but there, there were times that I resigned and he very well could have said, you know, and every time we worked it out okay. and almost every time he made the first move, he would call me or whatever, but there were times when I really dodged a bullet. I mean, the late Gene Michael said to me one time, wow, Rick, if you, if you got nine lives, you've used eight of them. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, my personality was that I would go back at him and, you know, he allowed me to do that. Was George demanding, would he just pick on little things or was anything legitimate, you know, as far as his, you know, what he was upset about to, to fire um, him or what? Well, what I mean, about? obviously, listen, Mr. Steinbrenner was an unbelievably successful person. So right. things that he was concerned about were legitimate, but some of them, and I'll tell you a quick story, Ray, the way I dealt with Mr. Steinbrenner, there was a plan involved which dates back to 1977 when the Yankees won the world series. And I'm an editor of my own baseball magazine that I started in my basement. And I landed an interview with Mr. Steinbrenner after they won the world series in 1977. And I'm sitting in his office. I got my three piece suit on, I'm, you know, <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm interviewing and I asked him a question about his management style do you manage different people differently or something like that? And his answer was this. He said, Rick, he said, there are two types of leaders, 
some men are Pattons and some are Eisenhowers, referring to the two World War II generals with very different personalities. He said, and I'm a Patton. So when I walked out of that office that November oh. afternoon in 1977, right. Right. I'm 22 years old. I'm thinking if I ever get this job, and I will get this job someday, that's how I'm going to play this. He's General Patton, and I'm like a lowly corporal. So when I ultimately got the job, it was always, I answered the phone when they, they would say, Mr. Steinberg is on the phone. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Okay. Okay. So, you know, right. um, sir, if I might, you know, if I might give you an, then later it became, sir, you know, I can't let you do that. <laughs> then, uh... you know, things like that. It got a little bit more. But, you know, we never really had a PR crisis in those 11 years. Um, I like to think I resolved a few before they might have happened. There might have been things that on impulse he wanted to do that I kind of talked him out of it. Or, you know, you, you know, like I remember him saying to me, all right, let's cut to the chase here. What you're saying is I should I shouldn't do anything. I said, that's what I'm saying. OK, but he would sometimes say to me, you better be right. Uh, better be right okay so okay. um i guess i was right more times than i was but listen right. Right. i loved every minute of working for george steinbrenner he was very good to me i love the man i miss him um we had some we had some challenging times and some really good times and 11 years later rick what, like do you leave on your own or, or, or what happens you know when you leave the yankees <laughs> no my contract after the 2006 season was not renewed and you know that, okay. there was no nefarious reason for it it was just you know right, of course time for a change my assistant replaced me and he's still there god bless him he's doing an incredible job i like to be proud that i might have influenced him on some of the things but uh he's very successful and i'm very proud of that Rick, um, I want to talk about Baseball Digest, but I want to ask you from 1970 to present, let me hear your uh, your your, your all-time AL team. Oh, wow. you're putting me on the spot. I would miss something. No, AL okay. team? Yeah, I'm not going wrong. I'm just going AL. Just AL? Yeah, just oh, AL. Oh, my goodness. I, I don't even think I could do that, Ray, because I'm going okay. to miss somebody. Ken Griffey Jr. is on that team. Okay. Um, You know, I'll say, you know, if I said, I mean, I, I – it's just uh, many, I can't do that. Close it's, ones, right? And it, it, but, you know, I, I, I'd have to really think about that because okay. people that come to mind are like Robin Yount, Eddie Murray. Uh, and I'm going to leave somebody out. Okay. I'd have to go through okay. through every right. team, right. and you know, right. What do you? Um, I don't know if you would venture into this, but do you have opinions on who should be in the Hall of Fame and who shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame? Well, everybody has opinions. Uh, I don't have a the vote. Steroid era, for example, what do you think of them? Like the Bonses and the, and the McGuire's. I'm going to have to be really honest with you. And, and yeah. some of them I know, and some of them are friends. Right. Some of them I get Christmas cards from still, you know, okay. people that were on, you know, my players, so to speak, Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens. I know a lot of these guys, but I do think there has to be a deterrent. Okay. And I think that when it's, when there's no debate about whether you used performance enhancing supplements, not just innuendo or rumor, when there really is no debate, and I don't want to get into you with, well, why is there no debate on this? We've seen it. We've seen the evidence. We've seen. Um, then I, I think that's got to be taken into consideration. Now they're all eligible, and I got to be. I've got to be honest with you, Ray. I'm a little surprised that I would think the baseball writers who are getting younger, right, would, would be a little bit more liberal, but yet neither Bonds nor Clemens, and I'll just use them as examples, can get more than 60% of the vote. Right. Um, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, but I do think there has to be a deterrent uh, to, to PEDs. And what it's done to the record books, because you can't look at a player and say, you know, I can look at Hank Aaron. I can look at Willie Mays, Mickey Mantle, go on Stan Musial. And I can pretty much know these are the numbers. This is their record. But the record now is kind of skewed. I don't know what the record would have been, you know, had okay. players not used performance enhancing supplements, but it's, listen, that is a, 
a tremendous issue for Major League Baseball and for the Hall of Fame, which are two separate things. Right. But when you think of the Hall of Fame and you think about the people that through, let's say, their own, you know, mistakes um, are not in the Hall of Fame. You know, the all-time hits leader is not in the Hall of Fame. The all-time home run leader is not in the Hall of Fame. You know, a seven-time Cy Young Award winner is not in the Hall of Fame. Um, you know, Mark McGuire, you know, who once held a single season record is not in the Hall of Fame. That's challenging for the Hall of Fame. Right. But I will, I, I will make this argument on behalf of the Hall of Fame because I get so tired of hearing it. How can you tell the story of baseball without Pete Rose, without, you know, Barry Bonds, without whatever. Well, no one's not, no one's telling the story of baseball without these, they're all there. Right. They're in the museum. You know, wow, there's Barry Bonds jersey or there's Pete Rose's helmet or there's Pete Rose breaking the hit record. It's all there in the museum. It's just that the Hall of Fame and the voters are saying, we're not going to give you that plaque because we think there was an indiscretion on your part. Obviously they're different. Um, Pete Rose's is much different than, there's a difference. Joe Jackson's is different than these other players, but it is a challenge, but I don't want to hear that. You can't tell the story of baseball without player X. Well, no one's doing that. Right. They're all there. Right. Just, you know, no less than they would be had they been inducted. Um, they just don't have that plaque. Um, I think that would make for a really awkward induction ceremony. I think there would be a lot of current Hall of Famers that boycott the ceremony. Um, it, it's it's a hot button issue. Mm, it's a hot button that. issue. Right, right, right. Rick, do you think players in a Bay Ruth Lou Gehrig would be able to play today at the same, you know, and be as 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 huge stars as they were back then? Well, yes, I, I do. I always had this argument with my friends. Like, I say, yes, uh, they could, but, you know, no, they can't yeah. because, you know. Yeah, they could because you're not taking them out of their era. You're, if you're putting them into this era, they would have grown up in this era. Right. They would have had training regimens, diets, all that of this era. I mean, they were gifted athletes, Babe Ruth. And, and you know, what are you going to say? That the greatest player of all time, arguably, couldn't play today? Um, now I think players today are superior for the most part as a whole than they were in the twenties, thirties, whatever. But, you know, if the 27 Yankees just jumped in time right. and showed right. up today, they'd have a problem. Right. But I think that you've got to think about Babe Ruth today. He would have grown up today. Right. He would not, he would, you just don't transport him and say, can this guy with that diet and that training regimen, right. you know, right. but your, your hand eye coordination is your hand eye coordination. And you don't, you're not going to tell me that you're going to go from 714 home runs to not being able to play today. Are the statistics back then a little skewed on the high side? When you see the stats on, on all those guys, those greats anyway, course the average players had average stats but you look at ruth jimmy fox all those guys i mean it was really out of this world statistics do you, do you think that was just skewed on the high end because of the of the bad gloves you know just the whole the whole baseball situation was just different so you well, can't go by statistics really i well but we do and, right. and that's the one thing that we use to compare um listen it's a different era i don't know how they ever caught the ball with those with with those gloves that they use so yeah they're probably more 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 we're more hits, but okay. it is what it is. Those statistics are etched in stone. Right, right. right. And, you know, it is, you know, we can debate it all we want, but those are the stats. Did you love baseball, Rick, uh, growing up um, uh, ahead of all the other sports? Was that your sport? It really was. And I'm trying to think of how it happened. And I, I think my earliest sports recollection was sitting – in my grandfather's living room and he would sit there and watch the old black and white games on channel nine or PIX. Uh, he was a Yankee fan. And I remember him telling me 
that that's Mickey Mantle. He's number seven, right? He was explaining about uniform numbers. Um, that's probably my earliest. I was probably like five, six years old. And then I remember on the day that my uncle Bob got married on October 1st, 1961, all the talk at the wedding was that Maris had hit his 61st home run that afternoon, even though I wasn't really following it. Um, and then I guess, you know, probably 1963, I went to, um, I went to a Mets game at the Polo Grounds. That was a lot of fun. But I think the big thing was going to either with Little League or Cub Scouts, a trip to Yankee Stadium. And that was like, oh my, I mean, to think about this building, this cathedral, you know, what I, I was, I was really impressed. And then when I heard that voice of Bob Shepard, right. You know, good afternoon, everybody, you know, whatever. You Welcome to Yankees, you know, yeah. but, and if, yeah, he, it was, it was a different Bob Shepard in the sixties than it was in the nineties or the eighties. He talked a little faster. He didn't, he didn't have that, you know, but <laughs> I mean, to hear a PA announcer, it could have been you, Ray. I, I would have been impressed. Right. Wow, this has got to be pretty important. And I, the other thing I remember about my first game was and none of my friends, we couldn't judge fly balls. We thought every ball they hit was leaving. Oh, yeah, the, yeah. Was I remember, I remember land on the street too. and it would yeah. be a fly yeah. ball to right field. Right. Uh, that was, the, but, but I thought this is kind of neat. And I remember maybe the next time I went, the first yearbook I bought was the 1964. Yankee yearbook with Ralph Houck and uh, and uh, who was on the cover? Ralph Houck and Yogi Berra, general manager and manager on the cover, black and white photo. And I remember reading the yearbook, Mantle, Maris, Howard, Boyer, Rich. And at the end, there was like something like the team behind the team. It was the front office, which was about 18 people. Right. So, um, that fascinated me. This is an attorney. This is a you know farm director, Bob Fischel, director of public relations. I'm like, oh wow. Yeah, I, I think I told my guidance counselor, and he, he he says I did when he tells the story. And he's 86 years old. I spoke to him last week, hmm. uh, and he's sharp as a tack. Uh, was coaching football until about you know five years ago or so, but and he he'll if he calls me. He doesn't say hello. He just tells the story okay. of right. me sitting in his office. He thinks that that was the most amazing thing that he, whatever. But, um, you know, that's where it started. You know, I told, I told the coach Dowds, I think I said this exact line. I, I'm not going to grow up to be Mickey Mantle. I know that, but I think I can be Bob Fisher. So that's, that's how my love of baseball started. That's fascinating because I used to go through those yearbooks. I, I usually went to the players and when I had when I saw those guys, I kind of skipped through those back office guys, you know. Yeah, but and most people did. Yeah. But yeah. I don't I don't know. I would yeah. say these people work for the Yankees. They get to go to I remember one time a friend of mine from high school and I in the off season, we, when they put tickets on sale, we went down to buy tickets to opening day. It was for the 1972 opener which wasn't played because players went on strike but i remember we went down there and our car broke down parked at yankee stadium we bought the tickets at the window so we went into the office and we said listen our car we needed water and the gentleman was nice enough to take us into the basement to get to a, a slop sink to fill the thing with water and we're in the basement of Yankee Stadium. We're like, the greatest thing that ever happened to us was your car breaking down. Right, right. I mean, it was like, you know, so I'm looking at these people and thinking they get to go to work at Yankee. How great is that? So that that's kind of my story. Did the, uh, What do you think of the, um, the, the current Yankee Stadium compared to the original one? Well, it's not the original one. It's a very nice building. It's right. very comfortable for fans, you know, but if you look at, and, and this can't, you can't duplicate this. So this is not somebody's fault, but when you watch those games on, you know, Yankee classics, you know, on the SDS network, and you see those games and that camera angle where you're looking at all you see is a sea of people. 
You don't see anything but people. Now, you know, it's so comfortable and the seats are wider and there's less seats and everything. And you don't see that mass. Right. Um, but yeah. those days are gone. They're real. The, the, you know, ballparks are different now. There's different amenities. It was time to move on from the original Yankee Stadium, which was built in 1922. Right. In like a, right. You know, in a, in a half a year. Uh, the infrastructure would not support anything, you know, any new suites, any new restaurants. Um, so um, the only criticism that I really have of the new Yankee Stadium is I wish that the monuments could be visible um, during the, I, they're behind a wall. They're not yeah, elevated. Right, and, right, um, right. you know, I've had so many, I overhear conversations of people that must be, where are the monuments? Where are the monuments? And that's my only criticism of the state. Well, it was so cool seeing those three monuments out in center field. It was so... Well, I remember when they were actually on the playing field. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, you, yeah. Know, uh, right. but, you know, those, those days are gone. That's not happening. You're not putting a granite right. monument on the playing field these days. But. Right, right, right. I still remember walking through that tunnel, seeing that grass as you're walking yeah. the first time, you know? Yeah, so, yeah absolutely. It, you know, so... Um, but the times has changed, you know, so right. it's nice to have comfortable seats and everything without those things in your way, those, those girders, you know, the pillars. Yeah. You know, but it's yeah. different, you know, people don't keep score anymore. Right. Uh, right. People are, you know, it's, it's, it's a whole new ball game as they what say. What do you think of baseball now, Rick? You know, I mean, I hear a lot of opinions, the analytics, which I hear is good. I talk to ball players. They, a lot of the former players don't, don't seem to enjoy the game. You know, I know some, I'm a lot doing, well, it, but yeah. I know a lot of people that I know that were huge baseball fans that don't enjoy the game. Uh, right. I don't think analytics is selling tickets. Um, you know, nobody's, you know, nobody's saying I got to buy a ticket and see how they shift on this batter or whatever. Right. I mean, the game is devolved into, you know, uh, 34% of, of balls are not put in play. They're either a strikeout, a home run or a walk. Uh, so 34% of the time in 2020, um, these great defensive players, these very talented young players um, are spectators. Um, so it's like Bob Costas told Baseball Magazine when we, uh, Baseball Digest, when we had him as the Q&A, um, you know, sometimes what's good for winning is not the most, the best thing for entertainment. So we've got to find some, middle ground or something because the game is devolved into a home run derby and too many strikeouts, too many walks, not enough. As, as Harold Reynolds said in our Q and a, we need more balls in play. Um, I think I have to look more into the whole gambling thing. Uh, I have to be honest with you personally, I'm really turned off by it. Um, I don't like someone popping up in the middle of the game and telling me there's still time to get a bet in on this or I like, you know, come on. Um, I don't know if we're creating fans with this. That's my concern, but I don't know enough about it to go off on it and say, this is not good, whatever. But what, I, because I take this to football. Now I see guys at the cigar club I belong to who used to be glued to a screen to see whether the Jets or the Giants were winning or would win. And now they, they're not glued to the screen. They're looking on their device how their player on their team is doing, even though he might be playing for the Detroit Lions. You know, hey, right. the, what a win by the Giants. I don't care. Beckham didn't do anything. I had Beckham. He didn't do anything. I had Shepard. He didn't do it. I'm like, that's – are we – now, if you're buying tickets, if you're watching, I don't think it's – I don't think it's helping ticket sales and I don't think it's helping eyes on the screen. It's creating additional revenue. I get that. But as far as the product on the field and the way it's embraced by fans, I think baseball has some challenges. Do you think, do you think they're going to overcome those challenges or what do you think is going to happen? I know it's the future, but do you think the game well, will, will yeah, evolve back that, again? I, I think they'll overcome the challenges. Okay. I, I think it's very important at some point for the union and for MLB to, to not be so darn adversarial and look at the big picture. Uh, there's a lot of competition out there. There's a lot of competition for those, you know, luxury leisure dollars. A lot of things we can be doing, you know, attendance has been down each season for the last five, six years before last year bottomed out at zero. 
I mean, attendance in Major League Baseball in 2021 in 2020 was zero. And this year, it's going to be down significantly. So it's going to take a while to get back to the levels that we enjoyed in the early part of the, the teens. Um, baseball has challenges. I mean, the pandemic alone and the impact that that's had on the game and, and the, the financial end of that. I mean, if anybody doesn't think this has been catastrophic, they're crazy. I mean, you, you no, no ticket revenue. And now this year, drastically reduced ticket revenue. No suites, no parties, no all this all these things and then on top of that we're going to be talking about a work stoppage that's very very troubling that that's that's live right this work stoppage that could that could happen this work What's stoppage that? in base well the basic agreement is up at the end of this year at the end of this year so at the end of the this year, year the next year will be the issue yeah. okay. so i don't think you know if you're trying to sell tickets to people coming out of a pandemic and um People might, their pocketbooks might have been hurt. You're trying to get those fans back. I think on top of that challenge, the idea of a work stoppage is, is not good for business. I hope both sides see that. Baseball Digest. Tell me about Baseball Digest, Rick. I mean, it was it was such a great magazine for me as a kid. I mean, it was small. You go through it. It's like you had to have it. It had everything in there. I know there's been some changes. Tell us about the most recent updates with uh, Baseball Digest. Well, I was basically asked, Ray, to reimagine the publication. Okay. Um, so the way I look at it, it's a print publication, largely. You can get every issue ever printed online up to the previous year in our archive site. Uh, so you can go back and read, you know, the December 1949 issue. Um, but I was asked to reimagine it and re-engage it with the baseball industry. Um, and I'm very proud of what we've done. We chronicle the game. You know, we have to write feature stories because we come out six times a year. So the stories and photos that I'm approving this Friday to go to press next week, won't really be seen till the last week in April and May. So we've got to kind of think outside the box. Mm -hmm. We've got to tell stories that have yet to been told or, or different slants on stories. We've got to make it look great. But it's someone said this is great because it's like a mini coffee table book about baseball. Right. Uh, I'm very proud of what we've been able to do in the last three years. I'm very proud that we've survived the, uh, uh, the pandemic. Uh, I'm very proud of the of the issue that's going to be coming out on May 1st, which will reveal our first ever Lifetime Achievement Award winner. I think that issue is going to get a lot of visibility. Um, and the feedback we've gotten, you know, and, and the best feedback is from people that kind of lost sight of Baseball Digest. The Bob Costas is the Billy Crystals, the Joe Bucks, the, you know, the Greg Browns with the broadcasters, Howie Rose, that we've kind of got back and really love Michael Kay with the Yankees, David Cohen, Paul O'Neill, you know, uh, Gary Cohen, Darling, Kerner. they're like, where, where's this been? And they love it. Love it. They, you know, they talk about it on the air, uh, but we got to give them something to talk about. Do you, do you communicate with all the players and are, are you, are you hands-on? Uh, well, I like to be hands-on. We have an awards program. Uh, we, we also, when you're on the cover of baseball digest, we give you a beautiful canvas print. Okay. Like what you see behind me of your cover, right. but we haven't been able to do that since 2019. You know, we had awards to present last April. I had a trip planned to go to Houston to give Justin Verlander the pitcher of the year and Jordan Alvarez the, the rookie of the year and you go to city field to give Pete Alonzo the, uh, the rookie of the year to go to Anaheim to give Mike Trout the player of the year. Well, now we have to ship them their awards and that's not the same. Mm. So yeah, I like to, you know, see players. Hey, did you, we ran a nice article on you uh, or blah, blah, blah. I'm tr trying to promote the magazine. You can't do that. You can't, I, I haven't been to a ballpark since I left spring training wow. on March 13th of last year. And I don't know when I'll go again, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll survive. We're keeping track. We're printing those covers of, you know, Mike, I'll, you know, I shipped old Pete Alonzo his to his dad. So he's got his, but you know, I got guys from last year. I got Max Scherzer, you know, I, I got a, a, a boatload of guys 
I got friend, uh, Tatis Jr. who was on our, I got Corey Seager. So uh, we got to get them their covers and I got to right. get the people that won the awards, their awards. I even bought a subscription. I'm hoping I'm helping. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, thanks for sending me the link. I would have got uh, you a discount, but. <laughs> no, that's good. No, that's, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. And where do you um, buy the subscription, um, Rick? That's a great question. The best thing to do is to go to baseballdigest.com and you'll be see the icon that said subscribe. Okay. Um, and you can also go to Baseball Digest Archive dot com. Okay. And that'll take you to where you can. You can have access to every issue back to August of 1942. Wow, I love that. Which next year will be our 80th anniversary, and we're planning a big celebration for that. Who is the greatest baseball player that ever lived? I, I'm going with Babe Ruth. Okay, okay. And Willie Mays is right behind him, and Hank Aaron. Uh, but man, it's tough to it's tough to go against the Babe. What he did at the time he did it when you when you're when your home run total is greater than every team in your league. Uh, and you're also a great pitcher. Uh, pretty impressive. And every kid, it's nice for a kid to have someone like that you can look up to him and play the game and talk about and kind of kind of dream about. Like, that would be Babe Ruth, right, for all the kids yeah. growing up? I, I think a real tragedy, and we're going to write about this at some point. I wrote about it in Yankees magazine years ago. It's a shame that, you know, an abomination of a movie, The Babe with John Goodman, yeah. was made in the early 90s for anybody to think that that was Babe Ruth. They made him a cartoon character. And then in the in the scene at the end of the movie where he hits the three home runs and what they portray as his final game, and it was not. Right. Um, I counted 12 factual errors in one game. <laughs> 12, 12 things about this were factually and completely inaccurate, including the fact that somehow they created the rule that there was a man standing on first base that when Babe Ruth hit a home run, he didn't have to run the base. Uh, he true. got the first and then the, now they never told you, well, what does he do if he hits one in the gap? Does he get the first and the guy runs the rest? I don't know. But right. that rule never existed. So <laughs> we'll never know. He also quits on the field. His wife is there. His daughter, none of that was true. That makes the William Bendix 1948 movie look like a genius movie. You know? Well, let's put it, they're yeah. both in the same class. <laughs> That's the interesting thing is there's never been a good movie about Babe Ruth. No, no. There's no, never been. No. I, you just can't capture him no. for some reason. I mean, Lou, they had a good movie, a great movie. When I was a kid, you know, I used to cry at the end of that. I was, yeah, you know, quite Pride a, of the Yankees. Yeah, that was, that was quite a movie. What do you... I'm going to wrap up. I want to hear your... Uh, what do you think of June 2nd, uh, Lou Gehrig Day? They're finally going to, you know honor that day for yeah, I, I think that's a wonderful idea as is uh -huh. jackie robinson day and roberto clemente uh, day right. um they say june 2nd because it was the day his streak started but it's also the day he passed away he died on june 2nd of 1941 but i'll tell you real quick ray um we talk about pride of the yankees right you know i used to watch that movie and you know i loved it um as a kid as a grown-up and one year in spring, and I'll make this quick, but one year in 1998, I'm in spring training and I'm watching the Academy Awards. Um, it was that, and it was the 75th, the 70th, the 70th Academy Awards. And they had this uh, thing at the end, and you could still see it on YouTube 70th, 70th Academy Awards 1998, where they brought back every living recipient of an Academy Award in the actor and actress category. And they opened the curtains and they were all sitting there on like bleachers, like a class photo. Right. And they started with a Julie Andrews or, you know, share, you know, and they went to, and I'm watching this. And the last person that they got to was Teresa Wright, mm. who played Eleanor Gehrig in Pride of the Yankees, but right. won the Academy Award for uh, the Little Foxes the year before. And, um, I said to myself, sitting there, I wonder where, what she's doing, where she is, other than sitting on that stage. And I wonder if she'd come to Yankee Stadium and throw out a first pitch. Uh. So I went to the boss and I gave him the idea. And he was like, you know, one of his favorite movie. It's a great idea. Go. So I, I tried to find her by going to the people that I work with at the Letterman show. Because okay. if anybody could find us, and they gave me the name of her agent. 
And I called the gentleman up and he took my call and his name was Francis Del Duca. And I explained to him, I saw Teresa on, and she played Eleanor Garrig. And we'd love to have her come out to any game she wants this year and throw out a serve. And he goes, this is wonderful. I'm sure she'll appreciate it, but I don't think she'll do it. Huh. I said, really, why not? He goes, Rick, she's 80 years old. I said, well, she doesn't have to strike anybody out. She could hand the ball to the catcher. He goes, well, <laughs> I'll ask her, but like, don't get your hopes up. Right. So like the next day, my secretary says, there's a Teresa Wright on the phone for you. I'm like, oh boy. So I took the call and it was that same voice right. as the 1942. And she was so excited and she, you know, she was going to do it. She's working. She, and then later she told me she's, I'm practicing in my yard with my grandson throwing a baseball. So she came to the game and she said to me, got her out of the limo. We sent for her. She lived in Norwalk, Connecticut. And um, we're walking in, we had lunch before she got, went down to the field and she says, this is so exciting. I've never been to a baseball game. Wow. I said, you've never been, you, you were, you were Eleanor Gehrig in Pride of the Yankees. And she yeah. laughed and she said, huh? I also died in Mrs. Miniver, but it was a movie. It was a role. I didn't, yeah. the next week I was on to the next thing uh-huh. and I've never been a baseball fan. So she stayed, she threw out the first pitch. It was a tremendous ovation, perfect end to the story, but the story didn't end because three weeks later, she's calling me up and she's saying, Rick, I'm a little concerned about the pitching. What is going on with Joe and the bullpen? I mean, she's like become this wacko fan. Wow. And um, <laughs> so she's making appearances. You know, she she gave Derek Jeter the toast of the town award at the baseball writers dinner. She's going to screenings of the pride of the Yankees. And it's amazing that life imitated art in that the woman who portrayed the first lady of the Yankees kind of became the first lady of the Yankees. Okay. And the best thing about that, Ray, was when she passed away in 2005, I was talking to her daughter and her daughter said, you have no idea what you did for my mother because you didn't know this at the time. When you made that call, she had just made the decision that I can't act anymore. I'm done. I've got to retire. I can't remember my lines. I can't travel. What am I going to do for the rest of my life? Well, you gave my mother a reason to wake up in the morning. Well, what more can you ask for than that? That is great. She was a very beautiful actress, too, in in, in those days. I mean, it was. uh, Yes, she was. She really was. You know, I mean, you hear Marilyn Monroe and, you know, know, Teresa Wright was very beautiful. And very talented. Yes, yes. Rick, um, anything, any last word or I'll I'll give you the last word. Anything coming up or. Just buy the magazine. Well, or- as I said, I would love people to subscribe or look for it on your newsstand. The issue that's on the newsstand is our preview issue with Fernando Tatis Jr. on the cover. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm very excited, as I said, about unveiling our Lifetime Achievement Award recipient in the, the May-June issue, which will be out the first week in May. But I would just encourage everyone to check it out. I, I think that I think that you'll really enjoy it. Rick, one, one last thing. Do, do a lot of people think you're the Rick Cerrone catcher of the Yankees? You think? I mean, you how could you think the, that? You're the PR director of the New York Yankees, and you're not the former catcher. How's that possible? <laughs> how could there be? Well, from my first year in baseball, back in 1977, we have had parallel careers. I mean, I've known Rick, single R. He calls me double R. He calls me R squared, really. But um because I have two R's in Cerrone, he has one, but I've known him since he came up with the Blue Jays in, I want to say, 1977. I've got a picture of he and I in 1977 Okay. Um, together. Uh, but no, it's been a common, how could you not? I mean, I've walked into ballparks and have people be <laughs> upset when I wouldn't sign their baseball when they think that I'm the, you know, the catcher. Um, so uh, it, I, I'm standing in line at the White House to meet George Bush. The okay. president. Yeah. And, you know, the way it worked is that you hand your card to this, I don't know, ambassador, attache, whatever, that reads your name so the president knows who you are. Bernie Williams. Oh, hey. You know, Tino Martinez. Right. Rick Cerrone. And when the, when the gentleman said that, George Bush looks at me and goes, Seton Hall. <laughs> and I'm like, no, that's not me. And he looked at me like, how's that? What, what do you mean that's not you? There's a, I mean, so 
We put one over him. And I told him, I said, I do for the Yankees what John, because he owned the Texas Rangers. Right. And John Blake was their PR director, and he knows John very well. So I said, I, I'm kind of the John Blake of the Yankees. And then he kind of laughed, and there you go. Well, we'll hear that story. That's a great. I'd like to hear the White House story one day. That's that's uh, that's fascinating. You had quite a quite a life, and there's a lot more ahead here. Thank Rick you. Cerrone, Baseball Digest. Thanks, Ray. All right. Thank you for tuning into this episode of New HD NYC. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast platform.